During his earthly ministry, Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. But what exactly does that phrase mean? Well, today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg investigates that question as we begin a new series. Over the next six weeks, Alistair will take us on a journey that begins in Genesis and ends in Revelation, so we can discover the unifying theme of God's people, God's place, under God's rule, and God's blessing. For many of us, much of the Bible is actually uncharted territory. We have our favorite passages. We have the stories with which we're familiar. But even the parts that we know, and we may know them very well, we are unable to fit together with the other parts. And if someone were to ask us, well, how does the book of Leviticus and all of that rather strange to our eyes and ears material fit within the whole idea of who Jesus is and why he came, we probably would be daunted by the challenge of answering. And because of that, uh, we're going to try and take a quick run, as it were, through the Bible. And this evening, actually, to fly over the Bible at about 30,000 feet, to fly over the territory that we're going to walk through. If you take the Bible and open it to the contents, the table of contents— You see there that it is broken into the Old and the New Testament. Incidentally, I make no apology for being as simple as I possibly can. And what we discover is that the Bible is a diverse collection of different writings. Between Genesis and Esther, we essentially have history. Between Job and Song of Solomons, or Song of Songs, we have poetry books— And from Isaiah then through to Malachi, you have prophecy. When you go into the New Testament, you can see that it is broken up in terms of first the four Gospels, and then the history book of the church, the Acts of the Apostles, or the Acts of the Holy Spirit. There then follows all of these letters, the most of them being written by Paul. And then finally, uh, John's vision from God, which is of course, the revelation. And when you put all of these pieces together, you discover that these books were penned by 40 authors or so over a period of some 2,000 years. But if we were wanting to encapsulate in three simple statements what the Bible is, we would say this. First of all, the Bible is one book, as opposed to a collection, for example, of Charles Dickens— where you have uh, David Copperfield and Oliver Twist and A Tale of Two Cities, etc. And you may read each of these books without reference to the other books. In fact, there is no reference between them to one another. You can have just a great collection of individual books on your shelves. The Bible is not like that, because it is essentially one book comprising these individual parts— And each individual part needs to be considered in light of all of the other parts and in light of what this particular book contributes to the big picture. So it's one book. It's written also by one author. God was ensuring that everything that the human authors penned was exactly as he intended it to be. Hence, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, all Scripture is theopneustos. It is God-breathed. It is breathed out by God. And in 2 Peter 1, uh, the familiar verse concerning the way in which people were uh, swept along, moved uh, by the Holy Spirit as God gave them utterance. So, what about the Bible? Well, it is one book, and it has one author, and it has one subject. And what is the subject? Jesus Christ, and the salvation that God provides through him. Now, that is not something that is true simply of the New Testament. It is true also of the Old Testament. And what you essentially find, then, is that the story that unfolds in one book by one author about one subject is a story that moves from promise to fulfillment— 
What is promised in one part is fulfilled in another. And supremely so, what is promised in the Old Testament finds its fulfillment in the New. God promises that his Messiah will come in the Old Testament, and God proclaims that his Messiah has come in the person of Jesus in the New. Now, that should be enough to make sure that none of us then are tempted to read the Bible as just a compendium of quotations. Not that we can't, but really that we shouldn't. And if the one thing that is necessary in real estate is location, then the one thing that is necessary in understanding the Bible is context. And so when we read the Bible, we have to read it in light of the verse, in the surrounding verses, and so on. And we'll say more about that as time goes on. All right, so it will be helpful then for us to think of one book by one ultimate author on one ultimate subject, namely God's plan of salvation through His Son, Jesus. Now, having said that, we still haven't found any way to unlock the mysteries of the Bible. Is there a mechanism that we can use? Is there a key? Is there a helpful framework that might be employed? Well, of course, there are many helpful frameworks, and if you read uh, theological texts at all, if you're familiar with materials that you can find in our bookstore, you'll find that there are all kinds of suggestions as to ways in which we might unlock the Scriptures. For a framework to be of any use to us at all, or if you like, a theme or an idea to be any use to us at all, two things need to be true of it. One, it must arise from the Bible itself, rather than being pressed onto the Bible. And two, it must be broad enough to allow each part that fits into it to make its own distinctive contribution. The framework that we're going to use is a framework of the kingdom of God. And what I want to show you is simply that while this is not the be-all and end-all of things, and while the expression, the kingdom of God, does not appear in the Old Testament, the concept is in the Old Testament, and it appears clearly in the New Testament. Now, for those of you who are in the know, some people say, well, doesn't this whole idea find itself in opposition to an approach which would view the unlocking of the Bible under the framework of the covenant? No, they're not in opposition to one another, because essentially God's covenant promises are His kingdom promises, and they're not in opposition to one another. Graham Goldsworthy defines the kingdom of God in this way. He describes the kingdom of God, he defines the kingdom of God in terms of God's people, in God's place, under God's rule and blessing. That does not say everything that is essential to say concerning the kingdom of God, but it says enough to allow us to use it as a framework for understanding how the Bible fits together. Now, if you're still with me, I'll proceed. Let me just draw the line all the way from Genesis to Revelation. This is going to make a mad dash for the book of Revelation. All right? First of all, the pattern of the kingdom is seen from the very outset of the Bible, in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, we have the world as God intended it to be. Who's in the Garden of Eden? God's people, Adam and Eve. Where are they? In God's place, the Garden. And what are they doing? Listening to what God has to say. And what's happening? They are enjoying the accompanying blessing of God. To be under God's rule in the Bible is always to enjoy His blessing. But that pattern is very quickly spoiled. We only go a couple of chapters. We're into Genesis 3, and Adam and Eve decide that life would be better if they live independently of God. They turn their back on God. They disobey God, and the results which follow are disastrous. They're no longer God's people. They turn from Him, and He turns from them. And when we go back and study it, we'll discover that they are banished from God's place. Remember? They are driven out. 
and there is protection and armaments placed with flaming swords. They guard the entry back into the garden. They are banished from God's place. They no longer live under God's rule, and they therefore do not enjoy God's blessing. Actually, what happens to them is that they face his curse, they are under his judgment, and frankly, the whole thing is a dreadfully gloomy picture. But God, in his great love, is determined to restore his kingdom. So the pattern of the kingdom becomes the spoiled kingdom, and as you turn the pages of your Bible, you discover then that the kingdom is once again promised to his people. That would be a third heading, promised. And you find this in God's call of Abraham. God calls Abraham, and he makes unconditional promises to him. Through Abraham's descendants, he says, there will be the reestablishing of his kingdom. What is going to happen? Well, they're going to be his people, they're going to live in his land, and they're going to enjoy his blessing. And as a result of that, through them, all the peoples on the earth will be blessed. And that promise is essentially the gospel. It's partially fulfilled in the history of Israel. It is only finally fulfilled in the person of Jesus. The fourth heading, or the fourth word, would be partial. Partial. The period that we're dealing with now, if we were to look down, if we could see, sometimes when you're flying on the plane, I ask the stewardess, I say, where in the world are we? And uh, I like that when the thing comes down and tells you where you are on the plane, where you have that little map. I'm such an inquisitive soul. But anyway, I often say, where, where are we? What, what are those mountains? I like to find out. And if you look down under the heading partial and you say, where are we? The answer is, we're between the book of Numbers and, the, and, and First and Second Kings. But I'll tell you more about that later, okay? Just so you can get your bearings. God's promises to Abraham are partially fulfilled in the history of Israel. That through the Exodus, remember from Egypt, God makes Abraham's descendants his very own people. He takes them to Mount Sinai and he gives them his law, his rules, so that they might be his people in his place under his rule and enjoying his blessing. In the same way that Adam and Eve had enjoyed the blessing before they sinned. And this blessing is marked by the presence of God. And the presence of God at this period is symbolized in the tabernacle stories, which some of us remember from Sunday school, and many of us haven't got a clue what that's all about. The tabernacle was symbolizing the presence of God amongst his people. And under the leadership of Joshua, after Moses has gone, they enter the land, and by the time of David and Solomon, they are enjoying peace and prosperity there. So what do we have? You drop down at 30,000 feet, you look down where you have God's people in God's place. Where? The land of Canaan. Doing what? Living under his rule. And experiencing what? Experiencing his blessings. But again, the promises made to Abram are only partially fulfilled. And the reason is because the people of God continue to be disobedient. And as a result of their disobedience, it leads to the dismantling of this partial kingdom— because Israel itself falls apart. And in that period of time, the story of the kingdom is a story that is then prophesied. And we will get to it, but after the death of Solomon, you have a civil war, and Israel splits apart. You have Israel in the northern kingdom, you have Judah in the south. This is 8th century B.C. or so. After 200 years of separate existence, the northern kingdom is vanquished by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom hangs on for another century, and then it's destroyed. It's conquered. Its inhabitants drag them away into exile in Babylon. And during this period, God is speaking to his people in Israel and in Judah through his prophets. And the prophets are essentially coming to them and saying, come on now, you're supposed to be God's people, living in God's place, under God's rule, and enjoying God's blessing. And Isaiah and Micah are the ones who go to the southern kingdom, and uh, Amos and uh, Hosea, 
are up there in the north uh, causing, well, I was going to say causing trouble, but actually doing what they were asked to do. And essentially the prophets explained that they were being punished, the people of God were being punished for their sin, but they were still offering hope for the future. The prophets were pointing to a time when God would act decisively through his king, the Messiah, who would come and fulfill all of his promises. The people of Judah probably thought that that time had come when they were restored after the exile, but actually it hadn't come, and the great time of salvation was still in the future. The prophet stands and says, "'Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before us like a tender plant, like a shoot out of a dry ground. He had no form or comeliness. He had no beauty that we would be attracted to him.'" He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the people nudged one another and said, Who's this? Who is he talking about? While he was talking, they were talking about the Messiah who was to come. And the Old Testament ends, Malachi, ends at this point, waiting for God's king to appear in his fullness and establish his kingdom. And the Old Testament ends, and then you have 400 years of silence. And after the 400 years of silence, Jesus steps onto the stage in Mark chapter 1, and he breaks the silence with a statement that fits entirely. What does he say? The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. And what we now have as we get into the pages of the New Testament is we have the now and the not yet. How is it then that Jesus can speak about the kingdom in present terms, and yet he still speaks about the kingdom in coming terms? Well, that we will come to. But Jesus is essentially saying, the waiting is over. I have arrived, and I have arrived to establish my kingdom his life, his teaching, his miracles, and finally his resurrection, confirm the fact that he is the God-man. He possesses in himself the power to put everything right. But of course, as you know, he chooses a surprising way of doing it, doesn't he? He chooses to do it by dying in weakness on a cross. That, you see, was a great concern, as we've noted through Luke's gospel. If he was really a king, why would he be riding on a donkey, on the fall of a donkey? If he was really a king with a kingdom, why doesn't he overturn these people? Why doesn't he establish justice and righteousness? Why doesn't he end all of this stuff? And by his resurrection, he declares the success of his rescue mission, and he further offers hope to those who believe. Now, we'll leave that there. But Jesus goes, and then what happens? Well, the kingdom is proclaimed. Jesus did all that was necessary by his death and his resurrection, and his ascension, as we've seen, signaled the end of the beginning. He has not yet returned. Why not? Because he's looking for kids for his kingdom. It's as simple as that. Hence, Paul says to the Jewish believers of his day, don't you realize that God's kindness would lead you to repentance? So the king awaits the moment of his final and ultimate enthronement in order that those who by grace have been made members of his kingdom may live their lives in the last days, the period between his coming and his returning, may live our lives in the last days to see unbelieving people become the committed followers of Jesus Christ, to see people who are not God's people become God's people, live in God's presence, under God's rule, and enjoy God's blessing. And here, in the moment in time, between time and eternity, in the period that we are privileged to live, we have the responsibility to encourage people to put their trust in the King, to be ready to meet the King. And the King has equipped His children— 
with everything that is necessary to tell the whole world about him. So what is left? Well, only the perfected kingdom. The king in his perfection of rule. One day Christ will return. That will bring division. His enemies will be separated from his presence in hell. His people will join him in a perfect new creation. At last, all of the gospel promises will be finally fulfilled. And the book of Revelation is the story of a fully restored kingdom. God's people. Who are they? Christians from every nation, tribe, language, and tongue. God's people. Where? In God's place. Where is that? Heaven. Doing what? Submitting to his kingship and enjoying his blessing so that the thing that was so dreadfully marred, where in the Garden of Eden all of the perfection of God's intended purposes for relationships are there with God's people in God's place under God's rule, and sin enters in the world. And as a result of that, all of the story of how the kingdom will come and is coming and is prophesied and is partial and is stopping and starting and moving and going finally reaches its great conclusion. And there's no doubt about it. No tears, no pain, no sorrow, no parting, no kidding. You could summarize it in four words, and I've done this before. The good, the bad, the new, the perfect. The Garden of Eden is the good, creation in perfection as God has made it. The bad as sin enters into the world. The new as a result of redemption in Christ, but it is not perfect. That awaits the day when his kingdom will finally come. It's not a fairy story, but actually we will all live happily ever after. It's the story of from one garden to another garden. From one garden to another. That's the theme of the whole Bible. It's also the subject of the new series titled The Kingdom of God that you're listening to on Truth For Life with Alistair Begg. We hope you'll be able to join us for each day of this study. If you miss a message for any reason, you can always listen online at truthforlife.org. Now, to help you follow along during this series, we'd love to send you a book titled God's Big Picture. This resource is based on the same themes Alistair is exploring the eight stages of the kingdom of God, from its pattern in the Garden of Eden to its perfection in the book of Revelation. As you trace through the Old and New Testaments, you'll begin to see how all the books of the Bible fit together to tell one story, and you'll see how you fit into that story. You'll find the book God's Big Picture to be a great help as you track along with Alistair's teaching about the kingdom of God. We invite you to request a copy today when you donate to support Truth For Life. The book is our way of saying thanks because your giving helps others hear God's word being taught. Ask for your copy of God's Big Picture when you donate today by calling 888-588-7884 or by giving online at truthforlife.org. I'm Bob Lapine, hoping you can join us again Wednesday as Alistair explains how our world fell into such a broken state and God's plan to make all things new again. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.